Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Danny Goto, and I'm the Executive Director of Innovations for Development and an Advocate uh, in Uganda. I'm glad to join you uh, as you launch this amazing project that we have so much hope for, a connection between debt and coloniality. It's an amazing innovation from your side. Um, I want to congratulate you on that part. So I've prepared uh, one or two, three slides to share with you that I would love to, uh, you know, um, bring. Okay. Okay, great. So, yeah. So firstly, I'll really bring the context about Uganda and the debt we have and its impact on the people and highlight a few suggestions that we have in terms of seeing how we can move forward. Of course, you know, Uganda is a colonial experiment. Um, we're 60 years old, now currently 43 million, 44 million people. You know, majority of a good number of our people still live um, in poverty with 41% earning less than $2. Yes, indeed, we benefited from the debt cancellation in the early 2000s, the HIPIC uh, initiative. But indeed, we still see debt coming back, crippling and, you know, causing serious consequences. So when we examine uh, the evolution of debt, of course, we see, as you can see, in the last couple of years, nearly debt has, uh, you know, increased in phenomenal terms, especially during and after COVID. Of course, there was a very huge appetite for, you know, more uh, borrowing because um, of insufficiencies in trade and incomes from, by government. So we are seeing that date from just two years has increased from about 44% of uh, percent of GDP to 54%, uh, now coming from $15 billion to about 20 to $21 billion. Much of this debt, of course, is owed to multilateral agencies, World Bank, African Development Bank, and IMF. Of course, uh, bilateral countries like China, which is the biggest lender, Japan, and the UK. Yeah, so um quickly when we look at its impact really it's seen in the appropriation in terms of budgeting much of the date the recent analysis shows that we even spending more than 15 to 20 percent of our recurring expenditure on debt financing interest payment and now you can see our uh, sectors accountability agriculture education health you know, uh, governors, you know, they receive very little. But we've also seen that this date is not creating jobs because a lot of it is invested in projects that do not have this you know, strong trickle-down effect. For instance, rail, you know, roads and the road sector, infrastructure development. It is good, but it does not create uh, opportunities for people. And then, of course, coupled with importation and of expensive materials that they're investing in. And then, of course, the lack of capacity to create sufficient jobs. So we think that the return, social return on investments for debt financed products are really, really low. And of course, the inherent uh, uh, way of how debt is financing mostly the private sector, as even the projects owned by uh, foreign companies. So on looking at uh, the other aspects of debt and, 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 and for instance, in the aspect of health, that the consequence of, of debt on, on health is that we see uh, the indicators on health broadly across the board. If you look at uh, malaria, for instance, which is the biggest uh, problem here, communicable problem, disease problem, which is killing roughly nearly 3 million uh, people per year, and nearly half of those are key children under five and pregnant women. So with that limited financing in health, about 5 to 6% of, of the budget current budget expenditure, which primarily goes to the human resource. We think that 
takes so much of what should have been invested in health and other social sectors. Um, of course, recently we've had a challenge of food insecurity, partly you know, contributed by external forces, like food has really increased 30%. The price of food commodities have increased by 30%. Compounded with poverty, where a majority of people uh, are poor, we're seeing a very huge number, nearly 5 million people are on the brink of, you know, uh, starvation and death, uh, particularly in the northern and northeastern part of the country. So, malnutrition compounds stunting, as you know, well, uh, a third of the population of, of people are stunted. Yeah, we still see the same underfunding in education and, you know, the conditions our young children studying in are really deplorable and that explains the low completion rate even at primary level. Only 50% 50 of the children complete primary education. And we see the consequence of that. For instance, if you pick adults and pregnancy, you know, the abortions, and, you know, unsafe abortions, the maternal mortality, which is partly contributed by uh, young people aborting and things of that nature. So we think that debt is robbing us of finances for education. Yeah, so having said that, we think uh, or we could give some ideas, uh, especially to you advocates in the North, uh, our position is that we need to, yes, not only look at debt per se in a narrow sense, but broaden the conversation of debt. For instance, one imagines the total debt of, uh, for instance, Netherlands is much more than the total debt of Africa. But how come Africa is in distress and the Netherlands is not in distress? Countries like Japan have a debt to GDP of 100%. So I think there is that politics of, of, of computation and mathematics of uh, the credit ratings here. That issue needs to be uh, you know, discussed and dialogued. What defines distress for this and not the other, something like that. But we also see the coloniality within the economic system of the world that makes developing countries continue to be extractive producers. We produce materials that uh, raw materials that are used by others, and they pay really peanuts, if you want to say that. And we earn less from what we produce, and we end up importing, including importing inflation, if you compound the food importation that we're doing. So that dialogue needs to be um, uh, done. But also the financial system is corrupt. If you look at the resources leaking out of Africa through illicit flows. Um, you know, and declared wealth, you know, capital gains and stuff like that, which really reduces the potential of Africa to have sufficient taxable income that can get into our coffers. Um, then we also see that um, there's no access to affordable financing. The interests on the debt and the conditionality is really a bit colonial and they really mimic the power uh, within those that get, lend money. So that conversation needs to be uh, held. But also the fundamental aspect of cancellation of some of this debt, really, especially the debt that we think is unjust. That we, uh, we know, for instance, some of these corrupt governments or weird political leaders are taking advantage of the people and taking loans that really have no impact on the current in the society and then the lenders really need to be accountable and responsible for the lending, especially to those governments. So the conversation also of reparation by those that really have rolled on our backs to be where they are, particularly the UK, which was you know a very huge uh, owner of an empire, uh, Africa, like the Americas and India and whatever. So we see that. By the time you, were, you were people in the UK and governments in the UK are developing, they had resources to, to take advantage of. So they must really examine that and look back and say, hey, 
I think we can do so much in terms of picking you up and supporting your initiatives to develop so that you catch up. And indeed, the UK will win a lot from Africa becoming uh, devolved because we become maybe a market for some of the goods that we have and then we share what we have as a human community. So yes, the conversation uh, can end on this, the conversation about the climate debt, because of course we know the climate catastrophe, which is really devastating Africa, is caused by industrialization, which happened outside of Africa. So that are those that have earned a bit of wealth from the industrialization and pollution of our mother earth really needs to be um, charged for that and compensate for the impacts that this climate change has created in some of our developing countries, particularly in Africa, which is going to uh, suffer most than any other part of the world. So with that, I really want to thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you. And I hope we can continue with this conversation. And I want to congratulate you for this amazing project that you're going to do. And I uh, look forward for the successes. Hopefully, we one day celebrate that debt is now a decolonized um, issue and for the past. So I want to thank you so much. And um, until we meet again, blessed.